Hey guys, and welcome back to another video. And today we're going to be attempting to isolate some lead from this mine dust here. As many of you know, I work up in the north as a geologist, and this is the dust that we swept out from the floor of the core shack where I work, and it'll contain some trace amounts of lead, so we're going to see if we can isolate some from it. The rocks of the region are primarily graphitic schist and quartzite, so this is primarily silica with some probably graphite in it, and then there's some other smaller amounts of minerals including galena, perodurite, pyrotite, pyrite, siderite, sphalerite, and arsenopyrite. All of those are metal sulfide minerals with the exception of siderite, which is iron carbonate. To separate out the lead and other metals from this, we're first going to sieve it to remove the wood that's in this dust, and then we're going to go ahead and oxidize it with potassium nitrate to convert all the metal sulfides to the metal oxides. It is important to do the sieving in a well-ventilated area to prevent inhaling the lead and silica dust. Silica can cause silicosis, and lead is of course very toxic. The fraction with the wood still contains appreciable dust, so it can be saved and the wood can be burnt off so we can also recover the lead from this fraction. The fraction containing the wood weighed about 2 kilograms and was transferred to a steel pan to be heated up. A tiger torch was used to burn off the wood and begin oxidizing the sulfides to the oxides. A steel rod was used to help stir around the mixture and make sure that everything was burnt. The fine fraction of ore weighed about 3.5 kilograms and was also heated up to burn off small wood particles and begin oxidizing the sulfide. While heating up the dust, it is important not to breathe in the smoke. The arsenopyrite decomposes and releases arsenic vapor, and the sulfide minerals oxidize and release sulfur dioxide. Both of these are very toxic. After heating up the ore, the larger fraction is once again sieved to a coarser sieve to remove any large rocks present. Using the magnet, I did remove a couple small pieces of iron, which we don't want contaminating everything. But a lot of this is actually magnetic, which is because there's a bit of a mineral called pyrotite in here, and pyrotite is magnetic. After the preliminary heating, the coarse and fine fractions had a combined weight of 3,412 grams. The fractions were mixed with one sixth their weight in potassium nitrate, which I show how to prepare from household materials in a previous video. Then the mixture was ground in a blender to thoroughly mix everything. As a note, the blender used is dedicated specifically to chemistry and should not be used for other things. After blending, the mixture was added to some steel cans, and then they were loaded into a furnace and heated with propane to around 1000 degrees Celsius and held at that temperature for 10 minutes. The potassium nitrate acts as the oxidizer to help oxidize the sulfide minerals to the respective oxides. Although sulfide minerals only constitute a small fraction of the dust, an excess of potassium nitrate is added as it will also react with any graphite present. Once again, sulfur dioxide and arsenic vapor can be released, so it is important to wear a respirator and avoid breathing the fumes. After everything was glowing orange and the sulfur dioxide stopped being liberated, the mixture was removed and allowed to cool. Once cooled, the cans were added to a steel pot and 2 liters of water was used to dissolve the potassium sulfate, potassium carbonate, and unreacted potassium nitrate that's present. A blender was then used to grind up all the solid chunks of material. The mixture was allowed to briefly settle, and the upper layer of water was transferred to two large graduated cylinders to fully settle. The slurry was rinsed with another one liter of water, and this was also transferred to the graduated cylinders. While the graduated cylinders settled, approximately one liter of 5% acetic acid was added to the mixture to dissolve any remaining potassium carbonate formed from the reaction of the potassium nitrate with the graphite during the oxidization step. This will ensure that the potassium carbonate does not neutralize the nitric acid that will be used to dissolve the metal oxides. The mixture was brought to a boil to ensure all the potassium carbonate reacted. After boiling for around 20 minutes, the slurry was transferred to two large beakers and a total of 150 milliliters of concentrated 68% nitric acid was added between the two beakers. I show how to prepare concentrated nitric acid from household materials in one of my previous videos. This should be an appreciable excess of nitric acid, as 150 milliliters is the stoichiometric amount of acid assuming that the dust is around 5 to 6% sulfide minerals. In reality, the sulfide concentration is much lower. The addition of the nitric acid forms soluble iron, zinc, lead, and silver nitrates within the solution. Once the nitric acid was added, some bubbling occurred. This is likely from the siderite being dissolved and releasing carbon dioxide. Some brown nitrogen dioxide gas was also released, indicating that there was still a bit of sulfide minerals present which did not fully oxidize to the metal oxides. The slurry was heated in a water bath and stirred occasionally. The material left to settle in the graduated cylinders was also added to the beakers at this point. The mixture was left to react fully for 5 hours, with an additional 30 milliliters of nitric acid being added between the beakers after 2.5 hours. After 5 hours, the mixture was vacuum filtered in batches and the undissolved dust was rinsed with water. 
The remaining undissolved dust likely contains traces of lead nitrate, so an excess of sodium bicarbonate is added to precipitate insoluble lead bicarbonate before disposal of the mixture. The filtrate obtained was boiled to reduce the volume to around 600 milliliters next. The mixture was quickly vacuum filtered once more to remove the insoluble impurities that precipitated out. A quick test was also performed where a few drops of the solution were added to some sodium bicarbonate solution and an insoluble precipitate formed. This indicates that lead, silver, iron, and or zinc are present in the solution. From this point on, we will start separating the metal ions, so I will include which metal is in solution in the top corner of the screen for clarity. Next, approximately 200 grams of sodium hydroxide was dissolved in 300 milliliters of water. Sodium hydroxide can be purchased from hardware stores as lye. This is a stoichiometric amount of sodium hydroxide, assuming the dust contains about 5-6% to sulfides, with 2% being lead or zinc. The sodium hydroxide solution was added slowly to the nitrate solution, and insoluble iron, lead, silver, and zinc hydroxides precipitated out. The mixture became very thick, and then became thinner again as more sodium hydroxide was added. The lead 2 hydroxide and zinc hydroxide react with an excess of sodium hydroxide to form water-soluble sodium plumbate and sodium zincate. The mixture was left stirring for 30 minutes or so to ensure a complete reaction. After this, the insoluble iron and silver hydroxides were filtered off. I found gravity filtration was more efficient as the insoluble hydroxide seemed to plug up the Buchner funnel. All of the insoluble hydroxides were rinsed twice with water. The insoluble hydroxides were added to a large beaker and the filtrate containing sodium plumbate and sodium zincate was added to a crystallizing dish. The sodium plumbate and sodium zincate were boiled to reduce the volume to around 400 milliliters. While that solution was boiling down, concentrated hydrochloric acid was added to the insoluble hydroxides until everything appeared fully dissolved. The filter papers were rinsed and removed from the mixture as well. By the way, concentrated hydrochloric acid can be purchased from hardware stores as muriatic acid. The iron 3 chloride formed is water soluble, whereas the silver chloride is insoluble. The solution was gravity filtered and the silver chloride in the filter was rinsed with some water. After filtering, the iron 3 chloride was placed in a crystallizing dish and boiled down. While the iron 3 chloride was boiling down, the silver chloride was added to 50 milliliters of water with 5 grams of sodium hydroxide to redissolve any lead chloride that may have carried over. This was filtered, rinsed twice with water, and then rinsed twice with 10 milliliters of concentrated hydrochloric acid to remove any residual iron contamination. After rinsing again with water, the filter paper was left to dry. The dried silver chloride was dark in color, as silver chloride darkens on exposure to light. Unfortunately, there was too little silver chloride present to remove from the filter paper and properly weigh. Once the sodium plumbate and zincate solution was reduced to around 400 milliliters, concentrated hydrochloric acid was added slowly. Initially, a precipitate of insoluble lead 2 chloride precipitated. However, as the concentration of hydrochloric acid increased, the solubility of the lead 2 chloride increased and it redissolved. The solution was added to a large beaker and boiled to remove excess hydrochloric acid and reduce the solution volume. While the lead and zinc chloride solution was boiling down, the iron 3 chloride was scraped off of the dish. Some of the iron 3 chloride was present as the yellow hexahydrate, so it was ground in a blender and heated further until all of the material dehydrated to brown and hydrous iron 3 chloride. This was transferred to a jar for storage. As the sodium plumbate sodium zincate solution boiled down, some crystals began to precipitate. Once most of the solution had evaporated, it was cooled somewhat, and then 150 milliliters of acetone was added to force the precipitation of all of the lead to chloride and remaining potassium sulfate, potassium acetate, and other water-soluble alkali compounds. Acetone can be found at hardware stores or in nail polish removers. Zinc chloride is highly soluble in both water and acetone, so it remains dissolved in the solution. The insoluble salts were vacuum filtered off and rinsed twice with acetone. These acetone insoluble salts were then left on a crystallizing dish so the acetone could evaporate, and then added to a beaker. Water was added until everything fully dissolved. At neutral pH, lead to chloride is soluble at 1 gram per 100 milliliters of water, so it dissolved as well. Once the mixture was fully dissolved, an excess of sodium bicarbonate solution was added to fully precipitate out lead 2 bicarbonate. The lead 2 bicarbonate formed, partly passed through a filter, so the suspension was transferred to a large graduated cylinder to allow the lead bicarbonate to settle out. Once settled, the upper layer was decanted off and the lead bicarbonate was rinsed with another liter of water. This was repeated three times to remove all of the water-soluble compounds from the lead bicarbonate. The remaining lead bicarbonate was then transferred to a crystallizing dish on a hot plate and evaporated to dryness. This was then transferred to a storage vial. While the lead bicarbonate was settling out, the acetone solution containing the zinc chloride was boiled down to remove the acetone. 
Once the acetone had evaporated, sodium carbonate solution was added to the zinc chloride solution to precipitate out insoluble zinc carbonate. Sodium carbonate can be formed by thermally decomposing sodium bicarbonate. The zinc carbonate was gravity filtered, rinsed twice with water, and placed in a crystallizing dish on a hot plate to fully dry. The dried powder was then transferred to a vial for storage. In total, 241 grams of anhydrous iron 3 chloride, 3.104 grams of zinc carbonate, 1.545 grams of lead 2 bicarbonate, and a bit of silver chloride was isolated from the dust. After the wood contamination was burnt off and larger rocks were removed, the dust weighed 3,412 grams. Based on this, the dust contains 2.43% iron, 285 parts per million lead, and 475 parts per million zinc. The higher iron concentration is expected as pyrite and siderite are more frequent in the rocks compared to other minerals. In a future video, I plan on decomposing and reducing the lead bicarbonate to lead metal, so keep an eye out for that. I hope you guys enjoyed this project, and I'll see you in a future video. Okay, bye.